Let's once again ask the Lord for his help as we come to his word tonight. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you. We acknowledge very obviously that if we were to face the power of this storm as it presently rages off of the coast of this country on our own, we would be decimated. And you are the God who stirs the winds as we heard from your word. Lord, no less would we be destroyed if we were to face you on our own. If we were to approach you based on your justice alone and based on our own merit, we would be absolutely undone. But we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can come to you in his name. We thank you for the forgiveness that there is in his blood. We thank you for the grace that there is in our Savior. O oh Lord, pour out upon us that grace even now by the presence of your Spirit as we look to your word. Use your word to encourage, to comfort, to direct, to strengthen us in the truth. We plead in Jesus' name. Amen. In September, you know that Pastor Smith had the privilege of going to Pakistan to preach at a pastor's conference, and his topic at that conference was the doctrines of grace. In August, just a month before that, I had the privilege of being in Haiti, and the topic that was assigned to me at that conference was the doctrines of grace. It so happened it was the same topic that has been rattling around in our heads and in our hearts as we've studied as we prepared for these two conferences. And then our own pastor's conference had as its dominant theme the doctrine of grace, the teaching of the Bible on grace. This morning we began our day together by singing a hymn by Martin Luther in the adult class. Then Pastor Chansky spoke of several of the elements of the doctrines of grace in his sermon, particularly unconditional election and the, the work of God in grace in saving sinners. And then many of you probably realize that October 31st is coming, that great Reformation holiday. All that's to say that my sermon tonight is not on the Eighth Commandment. But my sermon tonight is a sermon which I prepared when I began to prepare my messages for that conference in Haiti. And as I began to look at those five foundational doctrines known as the five points of Calvin or the doctrines of grace, as I began to prepare, I realized there was something more. There's far more. And so I, I want us, as it were, to approach this mansion of God, this mansion called the redemption of mankind, God's redemptive history, the biblical teaching on salvation. At the front of this huge mansion, this truth about God's saving work is a, is a door, it's a rather unusual door, and that door has, it's an arched door and has five major blocks in that door. The first block on the left-hand side is man's desperate condition, his great problem. The second block, standing on top of that one, is God's deliberate purpose, his purpose and plan to save sinners. The block on the far right is man's responsibility and God's promise. Standing on top of that block is God's powerful action. All of this having to do with God's saving of sinners. And then the headstone, the keystone in this particular arch, the one that holds it all together right at the center is God's de determinant or definite, excuse me, God's definite provision. 
Now, for those of you who know the five points of Calvin, you know that I've just given different names to those five foundational truths. But before, and I'm not going to look at those five truths tonight, that's just the archway, that's the doorway that leads in, if you will, to this grand doctrine of God's saving work. I want to look at five foundation blocks, five foundation stones that uphold this entire house and that form, as it were, five massive steps that lead up to that doorway. And those five steps, some of you have probably guessed what they are in light of all that I've said about October 31st already, they are the five solas of the Reformation. This is going to be a major overview, a flyover, a uh, very brief summary. And that because of some of the truths that I've already said. And secondly, because I would like to get you all home in time to meet the governor's uh, requirement that we all be home by 7 o'clock. That won't happen, but we'll get close. <laughs> So I want us to look tonight at this, these summary truths of these great salvation truths that were found or rediscovered or uncovered, highlighted in the Reformation. Now by using these various terms, I'm already making some points. I'm talking about things in the past. I'm talking about some historical realities. I said I'm talking about redemptive history, that is God's working out of his purpose and plan to save sinful men. I use the word reformation. At the very least, I'm going back to Martin Luther, 1517, October 31st, when he nailed his 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg in Germany, doing something like posting a, a grand announcement on the church bulletin board his disputation on the power and efficacy of indulgences. There you go, Jeff. <laughs> I'm not going to deal with the history. I'm going to leave all that behind. I'm going to leave that for the adult Sunday school class and for Pastor Smith to deal with at another time. But that event was something of, and as many of the historians de describe it, the spark that lit the bonfire that we know as the Protestant Reformation. I've used another term. I, called, I use the term Calvinism. And those of you who know me know I don't use that term very often. Of course, by using that term, I'm talking about historical realities. Somebody by the name of John Calvin, 1509 to 1564, and the truths which he articulated, uh, for instance, in his book, his books called The Institutes of Christian Religion. But beyond that, I'm also speaking of the Synod of Dort, because I'm talking about the five points of Calvinism. And that synod was just a group of people in Holland, a group of religious leaders in Holland that got together to deal with five complaints that were brought against the teaching of the church on salvation. We know that to be Arminianism and Calvinism is the outgrowth of those five answers or four answers, but five answers as we know them to those complaints. So these terms, redemptive history, reformation, Calvinism, point us back to something historical. So what I'm talking about today is of historical significance. As we heard in the Sunday school class, we are not novel. What we believe, what we hold to is rooted in a long history of, of Christian religion going back, back at least as far as 1509, and even further than that, because it goes back to the very foundation of this world, because redemptive history is God's working from creation onward and even back into eternity past. I want us, though, to look at these five blocks, and so I'm going to ask you to gird up the loins of your mind. I'm going to ask you to, to be sober tonight in your uh, abilities. I'm going to ask you to, to fix your hope completely tonight on that grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as we come to study these five blocks. Now I want to study these five blocks not merely as five truths, but I want to study them as five truths which affect the way not only we look at salvation, but the way we live. 
because Paul said, looking at that great salvation, he said this, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. He says, I want you to think about these mercies and what God has done for you in salvation. And I want you to understand them, and I want them to come into your life, and I want them to woo you and to draw you to live in a particular way. And so I want to look at those five foundation blocks that they might affect the way that we live. And at the very least, we might all be encouraged that the truths that we hold dear are truths worth standing on. Now, the other thing I'm going to do is there are five of these, and I have five points. And each point has one word, and each word has five letters. There isn't a child in this place that can spell tonight that won't be able to go out and remember the five solas of the Reformation if you can remember five, five-letter words. The first word is this, Bible. Bible. Now, this wasn't so much a truth that was expounded in the Reformation, as I understand it, but one that undergirded all that was going on. Everything was back to the scriptures, giving the word of God its unique place, recognizing its unique authority in all matters about which it speaks. When we talk about salvation, whenever we come to think about the realities of salvation, here's where we have to begin. We must begin with the word of God. God is so great. God is so uh, transcendent that there is no way we could know anything about him if he did not reveal himself to us. And we have a God who has done just that. He's revealed himself to us that we might know him. He's revealed himself in creation, Psalm 19. And he has revealed himself in the Bible. That we might know him and that we might have a relationship with him. Now creation, the revelation that's in creation is insufficient to save us but it is sufficient to damn us, Romans chapter 1. But it's in the Bible that we learn the way of salvation. It's in the Bible that all of these doctrines, the five points of Calvin or the doctrines of grace, whatever you want to call them, the five solas of the Reformation, it's in the word of God that these things are found. This is where they grow out of. This is where the doctrine of salvation is to be learned. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 15 to 17 makes this plain of the essential place of the word of God. Paul speaking to Timothy about his salvation and his experience said this, that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scriptures inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Here's your word. Here's your, your, your source material for finding out about salvation. It's the Bible. And in the Reformation, this is where it was. It was back to the scriptures, to the law and to the testimony. That if they do not speak according to these, these things, there is no light in them. Jesus emphasized this as well the necessity of the scriptures, the place of the scriptures in salvation. We'll come to this, I'm sure, someday in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 16, verse 29. Maybe you know the, remember the story, Abraham and the poor man, Lazarus. Or excuse me, the rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man goes to be with Abraham and the poor, the rich, excuse me, the rich man goes to, to hell, the the poor man goes to be with, in Abraham's bosom and the rich man looks up and says to Abraham that he wants somebody to go back and save his brothers, that he won't, they won't come to where he is. Abraham's response is this. They have what? The Bible, right? Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. 
No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes from the dead, they will repent. Surely if somebody rises from the dead, then they'll be saved. What does he say? You're right, I'm going to be raised from the dead. Jesus is going to be, be raised from the dead. Therefore, that's all we need. No, he says, if they do not listen to their Bible, Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. The biblical doctrine of salvation is rooted in the scriptures, comes out of the Bible. This is what was central to the Reformation. The Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. So when we're thinking about salvation and what it means to be saved and how somebody gets saved, and what gospel we should be declaring to them. We need to go back to our Bibles. No creed, no council, no person, that is, the Pope or anybody like him, no denomination, no personal intuition, no personal subjective feeling is to take the place of God's word. It is the final authority about how somebody gets saved. And so, brethren, we need to stand there. We do, and we must be our purpose to do so. Because, you see, there are a lot of people in Christian churches who are proclaiming a different gospel because they have long since given up preaching the whole counsel of God. I know because just this week I listened to two sermons by two men who happened to come across my desk and they were pathetically empty of God's word. Or picked and chose little pieces of God's word to prove their agenda. Salvation comes from the scriptures. Sola scriptura. It is the final authority about faith in the scriptures. And therefore, we must live by the word. Not only must we teach that salvation comes from the word. We must live by God's word. We heard about a children's song this morning that was a good children's song. There's another very good children's song with a lot of good theology. It goes like this. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B. L-E. That's good theology. And it's not just for children. Martin Luther said, here I stand. I can do no other, so help me God. Paul said, may it never be. Rather, let God be true, though every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and might prevail when you are judged. God is true, though every man be a liar. There's a movement among the churches today that's being called a reformation. The problem is all reformations that I'm aware of and that I've listened to people who've talked about reformations, all great reformations within church history have always been going back to the scriptures and bringing the church in line with the scriptures. This reformation, so-called, is not bringing people in line with the scriptures, it's bringing people in line with the culture. And the catchword is not back to the scriptures, the catchword is be relevant to the people. Brethren, that's not a biblical reformation. And it's not a reformation that we ought to jump on and find, ride the wave of. Because where it's leading is to a gospel that is not biblically rooted. So there's the first sola, Bible. Number two, point number two, another five-letter word, Jesus. Solus Christus. And you Latin people, please forgive me if I mispronounce these or put the wrong emphasis or wrong ending on any of these words. I'm just, I'm just a reader of Latin. I don't know Latin. Okay. Jesus, Jesus Christ alone. 
Now, no teaching that excludes Jesus or minimizes Jesus and his unique place in salvation can be in any way called Christian, right? Because it's got Christ, Christ right at the center of what Christian means. And yet many call themselves Christian and minimize Jesus' role. But in the Reformation and in biblical thinking, Jesus is central to salvation. Salvation is accomplished by his mediatorial work, his sinless life, his substitutionary atonement are the only sufficient grounds for our justification and our reconciliation. Nothing we can do, you know it, brethren, don't you? But we need to remind ourselves, nothing we can do, none of our good works or our religious acts can add to what Jesus has done. No other person could do what Jesus did. No other person can add to anything that Jesus did has done. No priest, not even Mary. Jesus has that sole central place of being the one mediator between God and man. 1 Timothy 2, 5. There is no other name under heaven by which men shall be saved. Acts 4, 12. He accomplished this work once and for all. He didn't have to do it again. He died once. He offered himself up once. And the sacrifice was paid. The penalty was paid. The debt was paid. We read of it in Romans chapter 6 in verse 10. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all time. Or Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 and 27. It is fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily like those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. Because this he did once for all time when he offered up himself. We've got... Paul in the book of Romans, the writer of Hebrews, and Peter adds his testimony to this when he says in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having put, been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Jesus Christ is central to this gospel. Jesus Christ must have that central place. Nothing should take away from his central place. No church, no organization, no other person, nothing we do, nothing anybody else does can add to the work that he has already done. It's only by that work that we are saved. He alone redeems us from the curse of the law. He alone died in the place of sinners. And he alone should be our great boast when it comes to salvation. This is the basic gospel. It begins with the scriptures. We draw it out of the scriptures. And when we look to the scriptures, what do we find? Jesus Christ is central to that gospel. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There is no other name. There is no other place to go. There is no one else to look to. But my friend... The world hates that because they want everybody to have a chance, however they want to, to get to God. They don't like, as we heard this morning, this ex exclusive gospel in Jesus Christ alone. Jesus and maybe somebody else. Jesus plus something else. Yes, anything but Jesus alone. But if it's not Jesus alone, then there is no gospel. The gospel has been perverted. Paul says you're under an anathema if you preach any other gospel than this. But that's the glorious reality. There's nothing more you need to do. One has paid it all. Cast yourself completely upon him. And here you will find complete salvation. How do you know? Because God said so. We come back to our scriptures, the Bible and Jesus. And being saved by Christ 
then brethren, should we live any other way than by Christ, trusting in Christ, following after Christ, taking up our cross daily, and following whom? Christ. Doing all things by our own strength. Doing all things in Christ who strengthens us. He is the vine. We are the branches. We must abide in him. The foundation blocks of this great salvation, the stairs that lead up to this glorious door, the Bible and Jesus. The second foundation block of the Reformation, the second foundation block of God's great saving work, another five-letter word, grace. Grace. Bible, Jesus, grace. Sola gratia. Grace. Free, undeserved favor. The Bible describes God's grace as manifold grace. The word literally means multicolored grace. When you think of God's grace, think of the pure white light of the sun passing through a prism. And that pure white light passes through and spreads out into this multicolored grace. It comes from the one true and living God who is the God of all grace. But then when it comes to us, it comes to us in such a panorama. It shows itself in so many ways. But it's all of grace. Wherever you look at it, whatever part of the hue you're looking at, whatever part of the spectrum you see, it's all of grace. We begin even with just what's called common grace. This comes from God. His tender mercies are over all his works. He, he causes the sun to rise. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, the righteous and the unrighteous. He hasn't left himself without a witness, but he's actually given to even the ungodly food to eat. Paul puts it this way. He says, well, what do you have that you have not received? Let's just, let's just do a, an inventory at the moment. And look at everything you have. Everything. From the Cheerios you ate for breakfast to the clothes that you're wearing on your back to the spiritual ability that you have to look into the Word of God and understand it and apply it to your life to the children that sit around you to the salvation that has come to you in Christ and forgiven you of all of your sins. What of that is not of God? What if that is not of grace? It's all of grace. It's all from God. What do we have that we have not received? It's all from his hand. It's all gifts from him. And if our whole being is of grace in a general and common sense for every single one of us, how much more his saving grace? Salvation is completely undeserved. Completely undeserved unearned, completely initiated by God, completely accomplished by God, applied by God, to whom God chooses to apply it, and then lavished upon those to whom he applies it. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3, verses 22 to 25, the heart of Paul's gospel message here where he comes right to the point of speaking of God's grace in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 3. Verse 22. And if you want a fuller explanation of grace, go on the internet and listen to Dr. Bob's, listen to to Ro Pastor Robert Martin's two messages on grace, and he does a, a broader survey of all the teaching. I'm just choosing a few little passages here to focus in on this reality of salvation by grace alone. Romans chapter 3 and verse 22. We'll start with verse 21. That's where the sentence begins. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, 
for there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, being justified by a gift, as a gift by His grace, declared righteous. On what basis? A gift of His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Grace. All those sins committed up until the time of Christ, he didn't pass judgment on them. He waited until Christ came that there might be a satisfaction for those who were his true people, even back then, that they might be saved through Christ. He hasn't judged us yet because of our sins. We sit here this, to this day. He has graciously kept us. But more than that, he'll declare guilty sinners, sinners who rebelled against him, sinners who deliberately disobey his law, sinners who do it on a daily basis, he will justify them, declare them righteous on the basis of what his son has already done. On the basis of the death of his son who died as a propitiation for sinners. What's that? Why doesn't he judge us? This holy God who cannot look upon sin. This God who created us and made us for his glory. This God who expected us to live according to his will, and which we rebelled against him. Yet he doesn't judge us. Instead, he provides salvation for us in Christ Jesus. And he sacrifices his son in the place of guilty sinners. What's that? That's grace. Above and beyond, lavished upon us in Christ, that's grace. We deserve judgment. But God showed forbearance. God showed grace to sinners. When we have become unclean and all of our righteousness, all of our righteous deeds are as filthy garments, he came. When we deserved death, he came in grace. The coming of Jesus is described as the coming of grace into the world. Pastor Martin looked at this passage in Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God bringing salvation has appeared to all men. The grace of God came, he says, when the kindness of God our Savior, Titus 3, 4 through 8, when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appear, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, whom he poured out upon us richly through Christ Jesus our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we might be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Salvation, graciously planned, graciously implemented, graciously paid for, graciously applied to those who deserved judgment. Salvation is all of God, an entirely gracious act of God. There's nothing that earns it. There's nothing that we can bring. There's nothing that we can offer. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we are that can say to God, save me. It's not because of the family we're born into. Not because of our fathers. It's not because of our own human decision. If we are born again, we are born of God. It is a free gift. A free gift from his grace. You know the texts, the key text, right? Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved. It's all of grace. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. 
And the gift of God there is probably something that deals with the entirety, the salvation, the faith. It's all of God. It's all the gift. It's all of grace. And if we were saved by grace, then, brethren, we ought to live by grace. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound to you, that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Or chapter 12 and verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. The fourth point, Bible, Jesus, grace, faith. Faith. Does that grace come to everyone? Does that grace take of Jesus Christ and automatically apply it to everyone who's ever lived? Is God of a God of grace who just automatically says, well, you know, I'll just, I'll just shower this on everybody and I'll just save everybody that stands before me in, my hu- in the human race. No. Right? It's to those whom he chooses and those whom he chooses believe by his grace. And the other, so the, the fourth point is faith. God does not call on man to work for his salvation. When God declares a guilty sinner to be righteous, he does so on the basis of what Christ has done. Christ's righteousness is placed on the account of the sinner when the sinner trusts in Christ. The verses we've already looked at. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 to 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to everyone who believes, Jew first and also to the Greek. In the Romans 3 passage, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all those who believe. It's by faith. And faith alone. Not faith that I then add to with my works. It's just trusting in the work of God in Christ. It's wholly, completely trusting on Christ alone. Exercising this gift of faith given to me in Christ that I might have my sins forgiven, that I might be accepted by God, and that I might have the hope of heaven. This is really what the heart, right, of what we saw in Martin Luther, who saw that chained Bible and turned to that Romans 1, 16 and 17 passage. The righteous man shall live by faith faith. It's all of faith. You mean it's not penance? No. You mean it's not good works? No. It's all of faith. Just trusting what Jesus Christ has said. Taking him at his word, casting myself completely upon him. Here's the next foundation block. The Bible. Jesus. Grace. Faith. We live by faith, don't we? That's what we're supposed to do. But somehow we come to faith in Christ. We come to, we are saved through faith. And then we think somehow I'm going to have to work something out here afterwards. I'm going to have to do a lot of Bible reading and that will somehow keep me in Christ. I'm just going to have to go to church a lot of times. Somehow that will keep me in Christ. That's the thing. Well, those are good things and those are the means of grace, right? But it's, it's ultimately, it just comes back to casting ourselves upon, we're saved. If we're saved, it's because of him. It's not because of all the Bible reading we do. It's not all the verses we memorize. It's not all the things that we, we do on top of that. It's just trusting in Christ. Now that faith in Christ manifests itself in doing all these things, that we might know him better, that we might draw near to him and follow after him. But those things do not earn anything with God. We walk by faith and not by sight. And that brings me to my final, my fifth point, my fifth five-letter word. Bible, Jesus, grace, faith. Anybody know the last one? Glory. Sola, soli, deo, gloria. Soli, Deo Gloria. 
We were created for the glory of God. When we sin, we, when we, sin, we fall short of that glory. We fall short of being all that God has called us to be. And by the way that God has orchestrated all this great salvation for us, as he's laid it out for us in his word, as it's found in Jesus alone, as it's all of grace alone, and as it's by faith in Christ alone, therefore it's to the glory of God alone. He gets all of the glory and we can't boast in anything. It's all to be to the praise of the glory of His grace. Ephesians 1.6 In the book of Romans, if you will, turn with me to Romans chapter 11. In the book of Romans, Paul sets forth from us from chapter 1 on this glorious gospel. Right? How men are sinners. How men cannot save themselves regardless of what category they find themselves in. And how God, by grace, sent His own Son to die for sinners. And that grace of God comes to us through Christ, by faith. It's only by faith, Romans chapter 4. And then all of those gifts that come to us, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then chapters 9, 10, and 11, he talks about this incredible sovereign work of God. It's all the sovereign work of God. That's behind this great saving work. And so Paul describes all this for those Roman Christians and for us. And we read all of this that he talks about in terms of salvation. And then he ends with these words in chapter 11. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom, Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. He says, you know what, I've been talking about this stuff, but it's, but it's beyond us, isn't it? As much as I try to talk about it, it's, it exceeds anything that we can really get a grasp on. It's unsearchable. It's unfathomable. The things I've already described to you. He's not even talking about the secret things of God. He's talking about the revealed salvation of God. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Who told him how to do it this way? Who has first given to him that he might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Paul gets to the end of describing this salvation with his great and brilliant spirit-inspired mind. And then he gets right to the end of it and he says, and I really can't understand it all. It's, it's so glorious, it exceeds me. And he doesn't say, ha, ah, I've got a corner on grace, I've got a corner on it, because I understand it all. Understanding what he understands, he says, I haven't even begun to understand. My algebra teacher was the first one to say this to me back in seventh grade when he said to me, the more and more you know about math, the more you'll know you don't know about math. And the more and more we know about salvation, the more and more we'll know we don't even know the surface of God's saving work. For all that we can get of all that he has revealed, it's only just the skim on the surface of the water. Oh, the depth. Oh, the richness of this great salvation. It's all to his glory. To him be the glory. Or as Jude puts it, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory. Guess what? When you get to heaven and you're standing before God in his glory, how are you going to be able to stand there on that day? By the grace of God in Christ Jesus, clinging to him alone. But this great salvation, this work that he's done, will enable you to stand before his glory, blameless with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority. Since salvation is all of God, then all the glory, all the praise, all the honor belongs to him. 
And so as Pastor Chansky prayed, and as we need to continually remind ourselves the words of the psalmist, and he only knew the shadows, not unto us, not unto us, but to his name be all the glory for his loving kindness, his steadfast love, and his truth or faithfulness. If he should say that, how much more should we say that? We're those chosen nobodies that Paul speaks about. Those people who are not mighty, not noble, foolish, weak, shameful. That's the majority of us. Now there's a few who wouldn't fit in all those categories, for he says not many mighty, not many noble, but this is basically the character of the people that God chooses, the base things of the world, the despised ones God has chosen. The things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are. That no man should boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. The salvation that we know of. The great truths that have been unfolded to us that have been uncovered in salvation. In, excuse me, in the Reformation. All of these truths that have been passed down to us. All of those things that we have been taught about the scriptures. And about Jesus. And about grace. And about faith. Are all to his glory. And in the end, we should do nothing. We should do what Jesus Christ did as he contemplated the great salvation of God, remember what he did? He prayed. He said, I praise you, Matthew 11. I praise you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you hid these things from the wise. What's he doing? He's praising God for his electing choice. I praise you, that you hid these things from the wise and the intelligent and revealed them to babes. Yes, Father, for thus it was well-pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son reveals him. So he praises God for this gracious, sovereign, saving work. He praises God for his electing work. He praises God for his judicial blindness on those that he didn't show the gospel to. He praises God for these things. But he does more than that. Because after he praises God for these things, then he preaches the gospel to them. He says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And that's exactly what we should do, brethren. Thank God for his electing work. Thank God for his incredible grace. Thank God for his irresistible grace. Thank God for the death of Jesus Christ for his people. And then preach it to the brethren. Preach it to the people around us that they should repent and believe and come to Jesus Christ. That's what we're meant to do with this great and glorious truth. We're to give glory to God and we're to give glory to God by preaching it to those around us. So there you have it. The five, the whole Reformation, the truth of the Reformation summed up in five words. Five, five letter words. Bible, Jesus, grace, faith, and glory. I'm going to throw in a bonus word. Right? Another five letter word. And it's really the word of the Reformation. As much of all these five are the words of the Reformation, this one is central. Alone. Alone. Sola Scriptura, the ultimate authority. Soli, sola fide, by faith alone. Solus Christus, in Christ alone. Sola gratia, by grace alone. Soli Deo Gloria, for the glory of God alone. You see, 
A lot of people like the five, but they leave out the bonus word. And without the bonus word, you've lost the other five. And so, as we put all these things together, we should be able to say, if you are a Christian tonight, I am saved and I must live by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, according to the scriptures alone. My friends, summary down a lane we've been down before. I don't think I've shared anything new with anybody tonight. At least if you're a long-standing member here, you've been around very long, you know all these things, you've heard all these things, you've heard reformational sermons before. But we can't let go of these things because the gospel's at stake. If we let go of these things, the gospel begins to unravel. And then we come under the anathema, the curse that Paul pronounced, for we end up preaching another gospel. Which of the foundation blocks would you leave out? Which one can we ignore? Which one can we deny? Which one is not important? I heard a man say just this past week, all that matters is that we love one another. And we shouldn't get all these battles. He says, this is what I don't like about Christianity. We've messed up what Christ began. Because we're fighting over doctrine. We're fighting over what we believe. And we can't get along. And we can't be tolerant. Oh, wait a minute. If I want Christ, I have to have Christ's words, right? Which of Christ's words am I at liberty to get rid of? Which of Christ's words am I at liberty to say, that doesn't matter? I'll just love everybody. Well, yes, we should love them, but at the same time, we should tell them they're wrong when they deny the word of God. Shall we get rid of the word of God and say that it's not so important that we just look in the Bible alone for our gospel message and our gospel methods? I don't think so. Should we somehow minimize this terrible, disgusting thing called the crucifixion? I mean, that's pretty gross. That's pretty gruesome, isn't it? A guy hanging there all bloody, dying under the wrath of God. Ooh, a, a God who's angry? That doesn't sound good. Let's pre preach a God who's loving. Then we have no gospel. No, Jesus' substitutionary death is essential. Well, how about by grace alone? Let's, let's just leave that aside and let people have a sense that they've done something. Then we erode God's saving work. Or by faith alone. Set that one aside, and you just go back to Rome. And each of us works for our way to heaven. In actuality, each of us just works our way to hell. You can't get rid of any of the five. And you must not leave out the bonus word. The gospel is at stake. And the glory of God is at stake. Pastor Chantry said this, wrote this in the book, The Shadow of the Cross. The true test of our Calvinism comes just here. How low is self and how high is God in your heart? And the true test, the true test for many of you as to whether you will ever be saved is whether you are willing to deny yourself and humble yourself and trust in Christ alone and the grace of God alone, and the work of Christ alone, and whether you'll take all of God's word as your final authority alone. Until you're ready to cast all hope of salvation in yourself, as well as, as, until you're ready to cast all of that away, you will not come to Christ. But if you will come to Christ alone, by faith alone. Taking him and his great salvation, which he alone offers to you, and give him all the glory. You too can know what it is 
to walk into this house of salvation and be saved. Saved from the wrath to come. Saved from the guilt of sin. Adopted into the family of God. Have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. But you must take his gospel, his way, in order to be saved. Well, it's not quite 7 o'clock. But may God be pleased to write his word upon our hearts. Let's pray. Father in heaven, be merciful to us that we would hold fast to these great truths which have been fought for, which, have been, which are rooted in your word. Forgive us when we've been at all ashamed or waffled or been unwilling to give you your proper glory. Help us, Lord, to stand for the truth. Help us to embrace a biblical gospel and to proclaim that biblical gospel to a lost and dying world. We give you thanks and ask that you would keep us, and preserve us, until we come back to this place again to worship you or until we meet together around your throne. We ask that you would hear our prayers. We offer now to you in Jesus' name. Amen.